Our reading this morning is from Mark chapter 8. As you're turning there and before we read, those of you who have signed up and are planning to take advantage of the theology class that begins next week, if you don't have your book yet, they're on the edge of the platform over here, my left, your right. They'll be stacked down there. Feel free to grab it after the service or any time during lunch. Mark chapter 8, we'll begin reading in verse 1 and read through verse 26 together this morning. In those days, when there was again a large crowd, they had nothing to eat. Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples answered him, Where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground, and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve to them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish, and after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied. And they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving out orders to them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And they came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees, walking around. Then again he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village." Last week, we considered the first story recorded for us here in Mark chapter 8, and I droned on for the majority of the time about how it was just mere repetition, and we're slow to learn, and we ought to learn from the repetitive things that we have recorded for us in the Scriptures. The passage that we're going to look at this morning from verse 22 to 26 in Mark chapter 8 also has a bit of repetition in it as far as a man who's blind being healed. But the way that Jesus goes about it is drastically different than the method that he has taken in any of the other miracles or healings that he accomplished, particularly or especially ones that are recorded for us. Which begs the question, why? Why is it Why did Jesus go about it in this way? Um, And I hope that we can come to an answer um, 
that is helpful and, and beneficial to us when we consider why uh, Jesus went about healing this blind man in this unique way. We live in a day and in a culture that disregards clarity. There aren't a lot of people around us in our world that are committed to things being crystal clear. We resist clarity because with clarity comes demands and expectations. With clarity comes obligations and sometimes change and often inconveniences. I mean, you can sum it up this way. At the end of the day, clarity from God to us as his people requires obedience. We see a rejection of that clarity in the very beginning in the garden. Did God really say? Well, he really did say. And it was crystal clear. But the serpent used that question of clarity to tempt Eve who gave in to sin and all of us with them. The disciples of Jesus, they were not immune to a similar situation of disregarding clarity. And we, along with them, and everyone who's ever lived, are prone to being in a similar situation of disregarding clarity because it comes with demands and obligations and changes and inconveniences and obedience. So Jesus, here in Mark chapter 8, uses the healing of this blind man to reveal our own proneness or susceptibility to not seeing things clearly. Our spiritual maturity happens in stages. It happens over time, not all at once. I don't think anyone here would like to argue that the moment God saved them, they understood everything perfectly. In fact, I bet no one is willing to argue that they understand everything perfectly even now. And some have been saved for decades. Actually, I find that as I talk with and spend time with those who have been saved for decades, they tend to be more aware of what they don't know than those who just have been saved for a little while. Because there's such a drastic difference between the dark and the light. So when the light comes on, spiritually speaking, we're prone to think, oh, this is it. And in one sense it is. But it's not all that it is. We do not immediately know all that we should when the Lord saves us. We do not know all that we should at any point while we're still breathing here on planet Earth. When we come across these physical healings from Jesus, so often they are pictures of the spiritual healing that Christ accomplishes in the lives of his people. Salvation again and again throughout the scriptures is referred to metaphorically. We saw it in Isaiah 42 and reading earlier. But even in Acts 26, where the Apostle Paul is recounting his own conversion and God saying to Paul and Paul telling others there in Acts 26 what has happened, God says to him, I am sending you to the Gentiles. Do you remember why God is sending the Apostle to the Gentiles? To open their eyes. Now, it wasn't a a, a colony of physically blind people. That's not who the Gentiles were. The Gentiles were and are spiritually blind people. I'm sending you to the Gentiles, God says to the apostle, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance. We see this sight metaphor being Used not only in the promises of God of old in the prophet Isaiah, but even here to the apostle. And so this miracle that God is accomplishing through his son, or in his son, in Mark chapter 8, and others like it, are pictures of our own salvation. We were blind. If you're in Christ, 
you were blind and now you see. John Newton said it very well in the famous hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It's a spiritual sight that God accomplishes in our salvation. Now, when we connect that reality to another reality that our salvation happens in stages, and then we begin to recognize here in this passage, what Jesus is doing is drawing our attention to that reality, that the salvation that he accomplishes in us happens in stages. It may go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. I'm not suggesting that you can be halfway saved. When you are saved, you are saved. But when we are saved, we grow in that salvation. And we understand more and more as we walk with God. It is true that there is a moment of salvation. I was lost and now I'm found. That's a drastic difference. I was blind, now I see. That moment is a reality. But the Bible also speaks of our salvation happening over time. We have been saved. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. But not only have we been saved, we are being saved. 1 Corinthians 1.18 the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, those, pardon, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So we have been saved by grace through faith, and we are being saved by the power of God through the work of the cross in our lives. And not only that, having now been justified by his blood, Romans 5, 9, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. We have been saved by grace through faith, we are being saved, and we will be saved from the wrath of God. Justification happens at a, mo at a moment in time, in the courts of heaven. There is a moment when an individual, every individual who belongs to God, there is a moment when they are guilty walking into the courtroom and acquitted and forgiven when they walk out. And it happens as a result of imputation, double imputation, actually. You walk into the courtroom guilty before God, and Christ stands and takes all of the guilt and punishment that is due you. And that wouldn't be enough. You couldn't leave at that point. You're a blank slate. There's no sin on you. Christ has taken it on. But, but lack of sin is not the requirement before a holy God. Righteousness, perfect righteousness is the requirement. So not only does Christ in that courtroom of heaven take on your unrighteousness as a believer, but he takes his perfect righteousness that he earned by living and dying in your place, and he robes you with that righteousness so that we walk out of the courtroom forgiven, justified, seeing. We walk in as a member of the kingdom of Satan, headed to hell, and we walk out a member of the kingdom of God, taking one step in front of the other towards heaven, declared, forgiven, righteous, acquitted of all wrong, forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ. But when we walk out, sanctification begins. Sanctification is right on the heels of justification. Sanctification in a positional manner, we have been set apart to God. At that moment, we belong to Him, set apart to be holy, and we practically work that out. We become more and more like Him, growing progressively day after day, year after year into Christ-likeness, maturing in our life of faith in Christ, seeing those areas in our life where there is lack and we add to those commands that we see in Scripture, we begin to do the things that God commands and seeing in our lives where we are doing those things that God has commanded us not to do and we begin to cut those things away and we become increasingly conformed into the image of Jesus. And sanctification isn't the end. 
But right on the heels of sanctification is glorification. Instant perfection. When you breathe your last, or if, we'll, if we are still here when the trumpet blows, it is instant perfection. When you and I and every believer on the face of the planet will be finished sinning forever. And we are promised resurrection bodies in which we will never sin again, only worshiping Christ perfectly and purely for all of eternity. Now, of sanctification, pardon, of justification and sanctification and glorification, the aspect, the time aspect that Jesus is giving emphasis to here in this miracle in our text this morning is sanctification. The sanctification of his disciples and our sanctification. Due to the needs that Jesus sees and discerns in the lives of his disciples, And due to our needs, this morning, Jesus takes a course that he has not previously taken to heal this blind man. It is a strange course of events. Jesus spit on his eyes. That sounds odd enough, but he's done that before and will do it again. He lays his hands on him. He's done that before and he'll do it again. He asks him, do you see anything? This is where things get a little out of sorts. The man looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes and looked, and the man looked intently and was restored. It's strange compared to other miracles. We go back to just considering the gospel of Mark. Chapter one, Jesus touches a leper and he's instantly cured of leprosy. No process of healing. No bandages for a few days and then everything is better. No medical regimen to follow. No therapy required. Or in Mark chapter 2, the paralyzed man, he just got up and picked up his stretcher and walked out. He had to be carried in and he walks out carrying the bed that he was brought in on. No follow-up appointments scheduled. No rehab required. Mark chapter 3, the man with the withered hand. He stretched it out at Christ's command. They didn't call the occupational therapy to teach him how to do his job again. He's just healed completely. Mark 4, hush, be still to the wind and the waves. And the calmness was instantaneous. No lingering waves to endure, but calm serene stillness across the sea. Or Mark 5, the man with a legion of demons. The whole legion left the crazed man, entered the pigs, and drowned themselves. There was no hesitation. 2,000 of them agreed. 2,000 swine on the same page at the beckoning of Christ. Again, Mark 5, the woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, a hemorrhage. She's healed By just touching his cloak. Jesus didn't say a word. She didn't touch him. She touched his cloak. No command from Christ. No touch from his hand. And she's healed. Further in that chapter, Jairus' daughter raised to life with a touch and a command. She was so well, so fast, Jesus commands them to bring food to her immediately. We scoot into Mark 6. As many as touched the fringe of his cloak were being cured. It wasn't just this one woman in one instance. Jesus is walking through town and people are reaching and grabbing. And Mark tells us that everyone that touched the fringe of his cloak, they didn't even get a good grasp. Just just barely nicking it. And they were healed. All kinds of infirmities. Completely healed. And the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, freed from the demon, In reading that text, you may remember, no word is spoken, no touch. He's not even near her. He just says to the woman, your daughter's well, go home. And she was. Or the end of Mark 7, where the deaf and mute man is healed. Do you remember the response there? Jesus has done all things well. 
He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. He does all things well until this. This partial healing. Well, what's going on here? It's so drastically different from anything that Christ has done before or that he will do after. He does all things well, or does he? There's some sort of glitch in the system. What's going on here? Why does this healing happen or appear to happen in stages? Everything that Jesus does is done with intentionality. I think we can agree with that. There's no happenstance in the ministry of Jesus. Let's look together at the actual miracle and attempt to answer the question, what is going on here and why does the healing happen this way? The short answer is the title of the sermon, Opening Our Eyes. The reason Jesus does it this way is to help us see better spiritually, to encourage us to seek to see better spiritually. Verse 22, and they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. I've, I've split the brief passage up into three points. Point one, setting the stage, which is verse 22. Point two, step one. Is that confusing enough? Point two is step one. Believe it or not, point three is step two. <laughs> so, setting the stage, step one, and step two that gets real confusing, just call point one the intro, and then you've got point one, step one, point two, step two. All right, this setting, they're in Bethsaida. They came to Bethsaida. This is near the place where Jesus had fed the 5,000. So, some may argue, and they may rightly argue, that Jesus, part of Jesus accomplishing this miracle before those people is judgment. They have failed to believe that He is the Son of God, even after experiencing the miracle. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus is saying again to the people at Bethsaida, I've accomplished miracles before you. He fed 5,000 among them, and now here He's accomplishing this village accomplishing this miracle in the same village. They brought a blind man to Jesus and implored Jesus to touch him. Evidently, the blind man has friends, and they are determined. We know nothing about them. They're just referred to as they here. They came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man. Jesus and his disciples came the blind man's friends brought the blind man to Jesus. They are determined to find help for their friend. They're not the ones in Bethsaida who are under judgment. They believe what they've heard about Christ, which is why they've brought their friend. This, this blind man has what many, especially the needy, never do, real friends. And they're bringing their friend who is needy to Jesus. They know where the solution is. Which is a good time for us to slow down, back up, and just ask a very pointed question. Are we bringing others to Jesus in this manner? In prayer particularly, are we bringing others before the throne of grace, asking the one who knows all things and can do all things, are we asking Him to work in their lives, to heal their spiritual blindness? Spiritually blind people have only one true hope, and it's Christ removing the scales from their eyes that they might, like us, say, I was blind, but now, 
Now I see. I was in the dark, but now there's light, the light of Christ. Are you bringing others before the throne of God? Are you asking God to remove the blinders and the scales from their eyes? Do you recognize your own helplessness? And do you implore God? They brought a blind man to Jesus, verse 22, and implored Jesus to touch him. They're begging him. They, they know that he's the only hope. And so they are crying out to him. Are we doing the same? Do we recognize that apart from Christ, we are nothing and can do nothing? And as a result, are we imploring God at his throne based on the blood of Jesus to act on behalf of those that we love and care about? That's the setting. Jesus and the disciples come to Bethsaida. A group of friends bring a blind man to Jesus, and they beg Jesus to touch him. It's understood that they want him to be able to see, but all they ask for is for him to touch. They, they know that he has the power. They're convinced that he's willing. They're just asking him, just touch our friend. Give him sight. Verse 23, taking the blind man by the hand, Jesus brought him out of the village. He took the blind man by the hand. I mean, it, they're in a crowded area here in Bethsaida. Note the personal interest that Jesus takes in him. He doesn't just say, sure, he's healed. He could have done that. He could have said, here's my cloak, touch it. Here's my hand, touch it. He could have just put his hands over his eyes and said, be healed. He could have done any of that. Jesus doesn't do that. He takes personal interest in the man, and he takes him by the hand. He doesn't direct his friends to escort him, saying, meet me over there, just outside the village where it's a less crowded place. But Jesus himself takes him by the hand, and he leads him. He leads him beside quiet waters and guides him in the paths of righteousness. He's a shepherd to the man. He's our shepherd. He leads us beside quiet waters. He takes personal interest in us, in our needs, in our situations, in our spiritual blindness in our spiritual obscurities, and He guides us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He brought Him out of the village, away from the crowd, so that He could give all of His attention to this man, and also keeping the blind man's attention on the healing at hand, and also so that the disciples could see and hear all that was going on, because He has them in mind, and having them in mind that's where we come into play. He desires for us to see and to learn what's going on here. Jesus spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, this intimate connection. It would have been incredibly offensive, just as it's offensive in our culture to spit on someone. It would have been offensive to do this, but not so with Jesus. He, he is intimately connecting with him, spitting on his eyes, laying his hands on him, and then he asks the question, do you see anything? This is Jesus who is all-knowing. Do you see anything? He knows what he sees. He knows what he doesn't see. He knows what he sees and how he sees it. He knew what the man could see and could not see. But the miracle is not just for the man. It's not just for that man's benefit. Jesus is making dialogue for the benefit of the disciples and for our benefit. The disciples heard what was going. It ends up getting recorded through the Holy Spirit, in order that we might read and learn from it now. Do you see anything? The man looked up. Having some sight, he said, I see men. So far, so good. For I see them like trees. Not so good. <laughs> They're like trees walking around. It's getting worse. It's better than being blind. But it seems like an odd step in the road, an odd pathway for Jesus, who, remember, up until this point, had done all things well and could heal with a touch or with a word or with neither. But something has happened. 
Something happened here in this initial effort, this phase one or step one of the miracle. I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. He sees better. He sees different from before. He didn't see men before. Most likely, the man had seen at some time in his life, if he knew what men and trees and walking around, he he had some idea of these things, so potentially went blind earlier in life. So something has happened. He sees different from before. He sees better than before, but he doesn't see properly. He doesn't see clearly. His sight is distorted and obscure. He's He's not seeing reality. He's not seeing things the way that they really are, because Normally, trees don't walk around like men, or men don't walk around like trees. It's really difficult to describe the man at this point in the story. Right? He's not blind, so that's an inaccurate description. He doesn't see clearly, so describing him as seeing is inaccurate as well. This miracle that Jesus accomplishes here is is sort of like a parable. It functions like a parable. It was performed this way in order to demonstrate a spiritual principle to the disciples, to us. Why was it so necessary to teach or to demonstrate this spiritual principle to the disciples? Do you remember what had just happened? Look back in verse 17. Jesus says to his disciples, do you not yet see or understand? They've witnessed all these miracles. All the ones that I mentioned earlier, they've watched it all happen. They watched him feed 5,000. They watched him feed 4,000. And yet, they continue to respond in such a way that Jesus has to pose the question to expose their heart and their lack of understanding. Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And do you not yet understand? And the fact is, those are all rhetorical questions. We can answer them. They did not yet see properly. They did not yet fully understand. They were still battling hardened hearts. Their hearts were not as soft as they should have been. They didn't see, but yes, they had eyes. They didn't hear, though they had ears. They did not remember, and they did not yet understand. And so that we aren't just taking shots at the disciples with an arrow... We'll throw a boomerang at them and let it come back and land at us. And we can ask all the questions of us and answer them also. We do not yet see properly. We do not yet fully understand. We still battle hardened hearts that are not as soft as they should be. We have eyes, but we don't see perfectly and clearly. We have ears, but we don't hear properly We don't always remember, and we do not yet fully understand. I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. And at this point, we say, yeah, that's kind of how things seem sometimes. But Jesus continues. He doesn't stop there. He doesn't leave the man there. He doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave his disciples there. There's another phase, step two, the next couple verses. Then again, Jesus laid his hands on his eyes. Then the man looked intently and was restored and began seeing everything clearly. So, what is going on here? Again, why does this healing happen or at least appear to happen in these phases or stages? Is it an inadequacy in Christ's power? Is he off on Tuesdays and this guy happened to catch him on a Tuesday? Is it an insufficient effort on Jesus' part? Maybe he just didn't try hard, didn't quote the right formula, or look in the right direction, or hold his mouth the right way. Is it possible that Jesus is teaching us an example of perseverance? You know, like the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Did his power just fail on his first attempt, like a a short circuit, if you will, in the divine system, a glitch in Christ's power? It's almost like time was frozen. It's just buffering or loading. You're waiting. Okay, it's halfway there. It's not really. We're, We're waiting. No. 
There was no inadequacy in his power. There's no insufficient effort on Christ's part. He's not teaching us perseverance. His power didn't just simply fail. There's no short circuit or glitch. He wasn't even having a bad day. He didn't need to take one down and sing a sad song and turn it around. So what is going on? Then again, Jesus laid his hands on his eyes. Now, this is not a drastically different approach than he took the first time or that he's taken previously with other miracles. And there's no issue with Christ's power or his ability. There's no issue or lack in the man's faith. Nothing's mentioned about that. He doesn't say, oh, you just didn't have enough faith. Let's try again. See if you can believe in me more this time. That's not the issue at all. The issue is with the spiritual sight and spiritual understanding of the disciples. The issue is with our spiritual sight and spiritual understanding. That's the reason for phase two. That's the lesson for us to take away. Now, of all of us who are here this morning, it may be that you're still blind. You may be like the man, and you may have been brought here by a friend or family member. You may have wandered in alone, but you may be completely spiritually blind. You may be here week after week and be spiritually blind. You don't have to stay that way. Christ heals the spiritually blind, not just in Mark chapter 8, but on cold January mornings too. It may be that you're not blind. It may be that God has transferred you from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of his love, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But those of us who are not blind, we're still not seeing as clearly as we ought. There's not one of us here that could not use more clarity in our spiritual sight. Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently. The man looked intently and was restored. Note the effort on the blind man's part. He wasn't just sitting around thinking, well, it's better than it was. I'll just live with that. Maybe I won't trip. Maybe I won't run into anything. I guess that's all the grace that God has for me. No, there's effort on his part. He looked intently. There's hope and anticipation, expectation. He's being diligent to work out his sight in the same way that we ought to be diligent to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because God is working in us. And it's then when Christ lays his hands on his eyes again and the man looks intently that his sight is restored and he began to see everything clearly. That word there, clearly, same word, previous chapter of the man that was deaf and mute. Chapter 7, verse 35, his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly. So here, this man in this story began to see everything clearly from, from far off, just crystal clear. Images that he wasn't able to make out previously. It was plain. He was experiencing clarity. And Jesus sent him home. Verse 26, this is common. We've seen Jesus do this before. Do not even enter the village. Now, this is only a temporary injunction. Don't use this for staying home every day, all the time, and never talking to anybody about what Jesus has done in your life. This is a temporary injunction for crowd control and waiting on divine timing. It's not yet time for Christ to be crowned. And so he just sends the man home. Don't go back to the village. There's also more judgment on that village. They had seen miracles and refused to believe, which is helpful for us to note. You may think, ah, yeah, you you know, you're right. I've been here week after week, and I haven't responded in repentance and faith, but yeah, I'll be here next week. No guarantees. Jesus sent this one who had been changed in a different direction, rather than to those who really could have stood to hear, but had refused to listen. So why does this healing happen in stages? If I've said anything, I feel like I've asked that question 12 times. 
Jesus does it with intentionality. He does indeed, Mark 7, 37, do all things well, including this two-stage miracle, even this two-step process. We could say it this way, especially this two-phase revelation of his healing power. He does everything, absolutely everything with a purpose. Focusing in on our sanctification by focusing in on the disciples and their spiritual condition. Remember that condition? We, along with them, we don't yet see properly. We don't fully understand. We battle hardness of heart. We battle seeing, though we have eyes. and We battle hearing, though we have ears. We struggle to remember. We don't yet understand. What are some of those areas where we fail to see and understand and hear? One of the areas that we're prone to not seeing clearly, that we're susceptible to not seeing as clearly as we ought, is seeing Christ crucified, seeing what he accomplished for us in his life and his death. When we survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, are we surveying it often? Are we gazing at the glory there? Do we see all that God intends for us to see as he hangs, bleeding, and dying for his people? Do we worship him for all that he's accomplished for us? Do we acknowledge the marvelous attributes of our Lord that are displayed there so beautifully, so wonderfully for all to see? We're susceptible to not seeing Christ crucified as clearly as we ought or not just Christ crucified, but Christ resurrected. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. We're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. He is risen, He is raised, He is seated and enthroned in the heavens, and we have immense hope because of Him who loved us with an everlasting love, Do we see him raised from the dead and one day returning and consummating his kingdom and making us kings and priests to serve with him forever and ever in heaven? We are susceptible to not seeing Christ crucified or Christ resurrected. You know, there are times where we're susceptible to not rightly seeing Christ's work in us. Do you see what Christ has done in you? God is at work in you, Philippians 2.13 tells us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Isn't that a wonderful reminder that the God of all glory is working in you, in your life? Ephesians 1.18, the apostle prays, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His power, pardon, the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. He's not just exerting a little bit of energy. He is exerting the surpassing greatness of his power toward us to guarantee that we finish the race, to guarantee that we one day see him as he is. We don't always see clearly Christ's work in us and for us. What are other areas that we're susceptible to not seeing as clearly as we ought? The wickedness of our own sin? Seeing it as vile as it is before the face of a holy God? We're prone to not seeing clearly. We're prone to not seeing clearly the lostness, the lost state of people around us. If we saw what judgment day was going to be like for them, we would, we would more readily make sacrifices for the gospel's sake. If we were convinced of their lostness, we would make greater efforts to get the gospel to them. We are susceptible to not seeing clearly the wickedness of our own sin the lost state of those around us who don't know Him. But we're also susceptible to not seeing the glories of heaven as we ought. 
when we do see clearly and perfectly, when all sin is gone and all sorrows are over, we live with Christ forever and ever in these glories. Will God, may God give us help to see in an ever clear manner, uh, an increasingly clear manner that we might see with clarity the glories of heaven and live for Him as a result. And there are other areas. What are, what are the areas in your life that you see men like trees walking? What areas do you need to see better? What, what areas do you need to understand more? What areas do you need to keep battling hardness of heart? What areas do you need to remember more often? We must not be a people who disregard clarity. Our confession says it in chapter 1, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, for our salvation, for faith and life, is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture. God has gone, we might say, out of His way to be abundantly clear in His Word, teaching us all things that are necessary to be known and to be believed for salvation. They are clearly taught in Scripture. So, as people of God, we welcome clarity and do not disregard it. We know what we also do as the people of God, not just welcome clarity, but extend charity. In light of how many of us and how many of those around us are still seeing men as trees walking, we should take care in both how we describe other people's spiritual condition and how we describe our own. For example, we may be prone to describe others who see men as trees walking as blind. They basically are blind due to focusing on what they do not know yet. Or we're likely to have a tendency to, to describe ourselves at seeing clearly because we know that we were blind and at least we do see something now. So how should we respond? We should seek to keep on pursuing Christ. If He has shown in our hearts with the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should keep on pursuing Him and knowledge of Him. Like the prophet Hosea says, let us press on to know the Lord. And we should seek to keep pointing others to Christ hoping in His mercy and trusting in His power, being like the friends of this blind man in the story, taking friends to Jesus, trusting in His power to grant spiritual sight initially and continually to all who believe. So, as God's people, we welcome clarity. We want to know exactly what God has said in His Word, and we arrange our lives accordingly. And we also extend charity because God saves us in an instant in that courtroom of heaven, but then we grow and mature as His children all throughout life. Back to Isaiah 42 that we read early in the service, God promising, verse 16, I will lead the blind by a way they do not know. In paths they do not know, I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do, and I will not leave them undone. This is God's promise to every one of you. If you're in darkness, don't stay there. Open your eyes to the light of the gospel and beg Him to change your heart. And if you do see, even if it's obscure, even if it's dimly, even if it's men like trees walking, Run again to Christ and ask Him again to take you by the hand and to lead you beside still waters, to guide you in the paths of His righteousness for His name's sake. He promises here that He will lead us, that He will guide us, that He will make the darkness into light before us, that He will make the rugged places plains. These are the things He will do. He promises to not leave them undone, not for a single one of us as His people. Let's pray.
Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your word that you have preserved it for us, provided it to us, and granted us your Holy Spirit that we might read it and understand it. We thank you that it is clear and that you've not been obtuse in your demands towards us. God, give us hearts that welcome the clarity of your commands and give us grace as we seek to obey them with our whole hearts, happily and continually and immediately. God, we pray for the spiritually blind among us, not only here, whether in our homes or in the community and workplaces and classrooms. God, will you bring about light? Will you shine the light of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ into those dark lives and hearts? Will you remove the hard, stony hearts and replace them with soft, pliable ones? God, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you will use it in our lives this morning. Having considered it in some small measure now, God, will you use it mightily through the work of your Spirit in us, making us more like Jesus, helping us to put one foot in front of the other, maturing in our faith, seeking to be more like Him who loves us with an everlasting love. God, help us to see more clearly your glories. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.